Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and tonight's video is going to be in two parts. So the first part is going to be on the topic that I plan to talk about. The second part is going to be really uh, for children or for your children, your grandchildren, whoever. Um, it's going to be a list of things you need to get together for a Sunday craft because believe it or not, I've just realised we haven't done a Sunday craft for a long time. So the second part will be literally a list of things you need to get to do the craft tomorrow. So tonight's video, I decided to choose human remains in archaeology and they do come up. Uh, it's not a common feature uh, with a lot of archaeological sites. You usually know when human remains are likely to appear. However, sometimes you do get random skeletons, for example, or parts of skeletons. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, really, what we can learn from human remains. Now, archaeologists have to treat human remains um, with a bit more dignity than the pottery, the stone, and that type of thing. And obviously, that's down to the fact they are, after all, human remains. So, for example, if we take a skull out of the ground, they're not held in one hand, for example, they're held in two hands. And when they're all collated together, they're given respect and usually reburial. However, let's imagine we've got a skeleton that we found. Um, what can we learn from it? Well, to start with, uh, you can learn, for example, what sex that person is. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there are a number of things you can look at to identify if it's male or female. The sad thing is, sometimes those characteristics can be very close together. So sometimes it is very, very difficult to tell male and female. But for example, if you take a skull, uh, for example, you can do this yourself. Uh, men usually have a more prominent brow ridge, a square jaw, for example. And usually, if you look at the back of the skull, there's usually bigger indentations where muscle, neck muscles, uh, attach to the skull. If you look at a female skull, it looks slightly different. It looks slightly different. The forehead's different, the jawbone's different, and so on. And like I said, this is a topic in its own right. So you can tell, literally, the sex of a person, to a certain degree, from those human remains. You can also tell the age of an individual, for example, to a certain degree. That's usually taken from uh, the teeth in the jaw, if you have a skull, um, because obviously certain teeth erupt at certain times. Um, you've also got to have a look at some of the bones because certain bones don't fuse until a certain age. For example, uh, if you look at leg bones or even the, uh, the, the, the actual what looks like cracks on top of the skull, they only fuse at certain times. So it, it's a good indicator of the approximate age of that individual. With teeth as well, you can tell uh, if there's much wear going on. And it's interesting because we often portray peasants, for example, in the Middle Ages with black teeth. But what you have to remember is there is no proper sugar as such. So when you look at that, um, peasant teeth is actually quite good. When you start looking at rich people, especially by the Tudor era, their teeth are black. Famously, Queen Elizabeth I had black teeth due to the large amounts of sugar they were consuming. From the human remains as well, you can also tell what burial practices that person had. For example, if you go right back in history, there was something known as a crouch burial. In other words, the person is laid into the ground crouched up. That's a good indicator that it's quite an old burial. And then obviously when we get to Christianity, uh, we face to the east to actually see the sun coming up, for example. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can learn just by what is technically a jumble of bones. You can also tell if there's any trauma to the skeleton, to the person. Was that a cause of death, for example? Are there obvious wounds to the person? The sad thing is you will never be able to tell what wounds were done to soft tissue, but any action on bone, you should be able to see it. There's also illness or disease. You can usually tell to a certain degree what illnesses or uh, diseases a person had because certain 
uh, illnesses, certain diseases do attack the bone and will leave scarring or marks on the bone. And then going back to teeth, if there are teeth involved, or bone to be fair, you can sometimes analyse the bone or the chemicals that make up the bone or the teeth. And you can sometimes work out where, for example, in Britain or even the world, that that person may have been from. And that's really down to the fact that certain chemicals go into the ground. When animals eat the grass, for example, they take in the chemicals. When we eat the animals, the chemicals go into us. So you can actually try and find geographically where a person's from. So human remains are very, very important. Now, one of the Bibles that I use when I do archaeology is this one. And it's quite a famous one. This is the archaeological site manual that was put together by the Museum of London. And it is absolutely fantastic. It's a brilliant guide to have. And I use it all the time. It's got different sections, everything from how to write the written record. It then takes you through how to record certain things such as timber, masonry. And if you go into skeletons and coffins, for example, it gives you all the information you need to know, including uh, an example of a fine sheet for recording human remains. And it's quite important that, like I said, we treat them with a lot of respect. Um, you also find in this guide uh, a little skeleton of three different people, an adult, for example, and a juvenile, and even a neonate uh, baby just down here. And it's quite handy because it acts as a guide to what you could find archaeologically, what that bone is, for example. There are further studies in bone. For example, osteoarchaeology is specifically looking at human remains or looking at bones. Um, so we won't go into much more detail about that. But it just goes to show how important bones are or human remains are in archaeology. Like I said, fortunately, we don't come across human remains all the time. Most of the time it is literally pottery, uh, stone uh, and those sort of things. They're the common things that we find. Anyway, I've got some examples here of some of the uh, injuries, for example, some of the diseases and that that you can find on bone and uh, it will tell us a story. And that's what archaeology is. It's looking at the evidence, the artefacts and then telling a story from it, putting together a story of what could have happened. And we're not always right, obviously. Sometimes we have to look back at archaeology in the future and then say, well, maybe we got it wrong. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have this written record, a photographic record. We record everything in archaeology so we can actually review it at a later date. So what I've got here is our first example. And these are leg bones, and you will notice they're not straight. And this is a perfect example of human remains showing us disease. And the disease that we've got here is rickets. And it is quite noticeable because you get the bending of the bone. And that's really down to the fact that there is not enough vitamins in a person's diet. So it will lead to a bending of the bone, rickets. It was quite a common uh, problem, quite a common disease years ago. And that's really down to the fact that a lot of people were malnourished, especially in the past. There was people having scurvy and all sorts, not just in the Navy, but even in towns and villages, even into the 19th century. And that was not that long ago. We've also got an example here of a socket and it is heavily pitted. That is a perfect example of what arthritis looks like. And therefore that will tell us a story that that person must have had a very painful joint. In other words, when that person got up off the chair, when that person got up off the floor, uh, he is probably going to moan or she is likely to moan. She'd be going, oh, ah, or in bad weather, cold, wet conditions, that person's probably going to be in a lot of pain. So it gives us an indicator. It tells us a story about that individual just from the human remains. Then we've got a skull. And this one shows uh, a very old and ancient disease, which is leprosy. And this causes all sorts of bodily problems, including huge 
uh, damage to bone as you can see just of here and that wouldn't have killed a person straight away so there would have been some heavy scarring uh, and a heavy mutilation of people uh, long before uh, death takes hold and that's an example of leprosy so you can see from the archaeology uh, osteoarchaeology from looking at human remains we can tell a whole story it's so important to know uh, a, a, about people of the past and that's why I uh, I'm specifically passionate about it. Um, we have here an example of uh, scoliosis or uh, curvature of the spine and famously we always used to think Richard III for example was given a bad press for years by William Shakespeare about his curvature of the spine however from the archaeology of Richard III we actually now know that he did have some curvature of the spine however if you watch any of the uh, William Shakespeare plays, he probably didn't walk with a hunchback, uh, dragging a leg, for example. He was a fit medieval knight, basically, a king, a king of England. Um, we've also got evidence here of trepanning, and if you look at a video that I did some time ago now, I actually showed my plastic skull with evidence of trepanning. This is a real one, which actually shows uh, a trepanning wound and this one actually has new bone growth inside that circle so this tells us that the trepanning was successful and bone began to grow afterwards we've got some trauma in this skull this is a skull that came from the burial pit at Towton which was a Wars of the Roses battle and you will see the sort of wounds a sword would do to an individual. We've got a sword slash straight into the face there. And you can see the damage all the way through the skull. Down, straight into the, bone, into the jawbone and down. An horrific, absolutely horrific example of medieval warfare. Um, Towton burial pits, by the way, are very exciting to archaeologists because they give us a lot of clues of what medieval warfare like uh, was like. There was a lot of injuries made to those people. And then a uh, final picture that I want to use as an example is a leg bone here, lower leg bone. And what you will notice here is this strange deformity just as there. You also have something going on here, but that's the main one I want to draw your attention to. Uh, if you think back to when I did a video about um, uh, medicine, for example, and surgery, medieval medicine and surgery, uh, this shows that the bone had been broken at some point and someone had tried mending it. In other words, they've put a splint on it, bandaged it up and left it. And what you've actually got happening here is new bone has grown and the sad thing is this would have shortened the leg which probably more than a hundred percent sure to be fair this person would have been walking with a limp so once again it's telling a story and that's why archaeologists or archaeology generally is so important studying things in great detail anyway on that note what about tomorrow well tomorrow we're going to do a craft so what do you need for that craft well we need some salad tape there we go we need our scissors and remember to get someone to help you if you're too young to be using scissors on your own also some coloring pencils or coloring pens and then finally some scrap paper it's best to use scrap paper let's save the environment uh, you can either have some plain white paper or if you're lucky you may have a selection of colors and if you've got a selection of colors bring them so hopefully you've enjoyed tonight's video just a brief overview of bones in archaeology and if you know anyone children that sort of thing that wants to do a craft tomorrow on sunday get those things together sellotape scissors paper coloring pencils it's all you need it's a very simple quite a quick craft to be fair Anyway, on that note, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.